Hello, everybody. Um, this is Nitin. <laughs> Nitin was my first uh, master's student and then also my first PhD student. So it's very nice to see that Nitin's graduating. And um, we first met back in 2012 or something. Um, Nitin was working with the technology transfer team, did a whole lot of really good work on module materials. And so then we sort of got him back to do some more similar work. Um, and then even though he sort of went on to doing different things with, with Stuart's group in the hydrogenation space um, on um, BO defects. He doesn't have BO though, he actually smells good. <laughs> um, but um, still really, really happy to see Nitin graduate. So anyway, take it away, Nitin. All right. Thanks for the introduction, Matt. And welcome everybody. Uh, so the topic of my presentation is the boron oxygen defect which was the main focus of my, of my thesis. And I get a feeling I'm going to go a bit over time, so apologies in advance. We started a bit late as well. All right, so I'll dig right into it. Um, so to sort of explain why the boron oxygen defect is important, I'd like to bring your attention to the trends in, um, in the Silic uh, the silicon PV industry uh, at the moment. So the blue um, markers here uh, are P-type silicon material. And you can see that it's going to be the dominant material for the foreseeable future. Um, another trend you see over here is perk cells, which is the, uh, the orange bar uh, becoming more dominant. Um, now we all kind of know this, the reason why this is significant is it has a lot to do with why the boron oxygen defect is more and more significant uh, for these kind of cell types. Uh, and in addition to that, the surface passivation of, uh, of solar cells is getting better. And what all of this means at the end is that there's a strong imperative to try and improve the bulk quality of the material and minimize any kind of cell degradation because that can really affect your efficiency and especially so for solar cells of the future. So the boron oxygen defect is important because it's the most significant source of light induced degradation uh, in commercial solar cells today. So to give you an idea of the kind of efficiency losses you can expect, uh, so for perk cells uh, it's, it can be as high as 12% relative loss in efficiency and for aluminium BSF cells it can be as high as 6%. So if we crunch the numbers you can see that for uh, a cell manufacturer making a gigawatt per year uh, that's about 12 to 20 million in lost savings just because of efficiency loss so uh, it's quite a big figure. So this drives home the point that mitigation of boron oxygen defects is, is quite important. So the boron oxygen defect uh, requires the presence of boron and oxygen, but the exact configuration of boron and oxygen in the material in, in silicon is, is unknown. But what we do know is that it causes light induced degradation and that looks like this. So if you measure your open circuit voltage or your effective lifetime as you light soak these wafers or illuminate them at room temperature, you see a degradation, but it can be temporarily deactivated um, if you anneal it in the dark at, for a few minutes at about 200 degrees. But this deactivation isn't permanent, so if you light soak it, light soak the wafers again, then you see the performance coming down again. Uh, there is a way to permanently deactivate these, uh, these defects as well, and that's by doing an illuminated annealing. So it's at high temperatures and um, high light intensities. And if you do that, then further light soaking doesn't uh, cause any more degradation. So you can sort of understand the behavior of the defect using a three state model. So in this case, state B, uh, we refer to as the degraded state. State A is this temporarily annealed uh, state. And state C is the permanently deactivated state. Um, so for each two states, there's, you know, reactions, uh, transitions going both ways. Um, there's also, in theory, 
uh, you could have this transition directly between states A and C, um, but there's been no evidence of that so far. So we mostly talk about these four reactions and the three states of the boron oxygen defect. So in this work, uh, I'm going to focus on, on three aspects. One is the recombination properties of the defect in its recombination active form, which is state B. I'm also going to be looking at the reaction kinetics of some of these reactions. And lastly, I'll be looking into the uh, mechanisms underlying the permanent deactivation. So starting out with the first part of my talk, which is about the recombination properties of the defect. So if you start off with a silicon wafer, uh, you have a, an unknown amount of boron oxygen, uh, say immediately after uh, the wafer has been uh, in, a, in a wafer that hasn't been processed yet. And if you dark anneal it, then you sort of temporarily deactivate the defect. And you can describe the effective lifetime related to that, to this dark anneal state um, using uh, this harmonic sum of, say, the surface lifetime and the background bulk lifetime in this case. And then if you light suck the wafers, you fully activate the boron oxygen defect, and your effective lifetime is now a sum uh, that includes the SRH lifetime of the boron oxygen defect. And if you sort of uh, expand the, the SRH equation, you see that there's a bunch of terms here. And the ones that are the most important and particular to the defect are this P1 and N1 terms, and you can see that P1 is sensitive to the trap level of the defect. Uh, this tau naught, tau N naught, and tau P naught are sensitive to the trap density and the capture cross sections of holes and electrons. Now we can sort of combine the information about the capture cross sections using a ratio, and we'll call it K, and that's the capture cross section ratio of uh, the electron and hole capture cross sections. So in other words, the, the properties of the boron oxygen defect can be comple completely described by these three uh, parameters. So let's talk about the trap level and the capture cross-section uh, ratio. So these are supposed to be fundamental properties of the defect. Um, and you can do um, temperature-dependent lifetime spectroscopy and try to figure out what these values are. Uh, you can also try and fit some of these parameters using <coughs> injection-dependent lifetime spectroscopy. Um, the issue is the different studies, especially with the IDLS method, uh, give slightly different values of the capture cross-section ratio, which begs the question, what is the real value of K and how much statistical uncertainty in K there actually is? Um, and if we consider the temperature dependence of things, if the K value is not quite right, or it's, there's some uncertainty in it, it could also mean that the trap level itself is not uh, well known. So uh, I'll be looking into those. So now if we consider the trap density, um, the trap density can be uh, expressed using this equation here, which is uh, a function, importantly, of the capture cross-section and not the ratio. Now, the capture cross-section is a bit difficult to determine from uh, lifetime spectroscopy. Um, and so what we normally do is we try and find a metric that's proportional to the trap density. Um, so if you take the inverse lifetime uh, in the light soak state, in the dark anneal state, for example, that gives you a measure of the normalized defect density, which is uh, you know, representative of the real trap density. So if we look at the inverse lifetime curves in the fully degraded and the annealed states, um, and you pick an injection level that's low enough, then uh, you end up with this inverse lifetime. And for some value of degradation between the fully degraded and fully annealed, um, you end up with a, with a different inverse lifetime. And so the difference between the red and the black is what uh, is NDD. And you can see that it sort of scales between uh, some sort of random value at fully degraded state and then zero at the annealed state. Um, 
So importantly, the trap density is not fixed, and the amount of active traps you have uh, can be highly sensitive to processing conditions. So we've already seen light soaking or dark annealing affects the trap density. Uh, but so does high temperature processes. So I'm talking about something above 400 or 500 degrees. And, and you can see that phosphorus diffusion or oxidation, so typical steps that you use in um, solar cell fabrication uh, can cause a change in the, the defect density of boron oxygen. And so can firing, which is, again, also an important step in solar cell fabrication. Um, so on the one hand, this is, uh, it's important to know, uh, but this is also an opportunity to, uh, to reduce the boron oxygen concentrations during cell fabrication. So it's providing some opportunities to mitigate the defect. Um, but the question I'll be trying to answer today is, what is the impact of firing in particular on the trap density? And further, if... Uh, is, is the capture cross-section ratio, which should be a property of the defect itself, but does that change with firing conditions as well? Um, so we'll start off with the SRH properties. Again, the trap, dense, uh, the trap level and the capture cross-section ratio. Um, as I've already mentioned, there's, there's a few different methods to determine the uh, recombination properties. Of these, I'll be using injection-dependent lifetime spectroscopy and temperature and injection-dependent lifetime spectroscopy. Um, so if we start off with a, with a dark annealed curve, um, uh, dark annealed inverse lifetime curve, um, we can fit this using uh, certain components of lifetime. And the, the inverse lifetime after light soaking uh, looks like this, and you can fit that, uh, again, with an additional component for the boron oxygen. So there's, there's a few different ways to determine the capture cross-section ratio. Um, so on the left side, let's call it the constraint method. You can subtract the red and the black curves and fit, try and fit K to that curve, uh, and you can get the K value that way. Um, but let's say the we allow one of these other parameters in the lifetime uh, to change, uh, then we can end up with a, with a different k-value. So you see it's, it's quite sensitive uh, to, to the analysis method that you use. So likewise, uh, what if there's small changes in other lifetime components between the, li the light soak stage and the dark annealed stage? Um, so to to understand this, uh, I basically uh, collected a lot of uh, data uh, before and after light soaking and try to fit the value of k to these curves using different methods, so allowing um, some components to change while keeping others fixed and, and so on, different permutations. But what you can see over here is that regardless of the, the method, the k value is consistently greater than what the established value in the literature is, which is 9.3 um, for the samples in this study. Um, now, within, for each method, there's also a big range of variation in the, in the k-values. And that's because not all fitting methods are um, necessarily result in a good fit to the data. So that's something to consider as well. So in this case, you can see the uh, methods I and J on the right side have a very poor fit, uh, whereas the other methods seem to have a, a better fit to the lifetime curves. Um, so that's, that's a conclusion. Not all fitting methods are accurate, and you should really consider this when you're trying to determine the recombination properties. So as it happens, uh, the, if we allow the J0E or the surface lifetime to slightly change, then uh, that results in the most accurate uh, values for K. Um, and if we consider that particular method, then we get a value of roughly 12 as opposed to uh, 9 or 10. Um, and so if we then do the same kind of fitting uh, for lifetime curves at different temperatures, um, so in this case, this is the dark annealed curves, and this is the light soaked curves. 
uh, you can start extracting information uh, of the temperature dependence of things and determine the trap density, uh, sorry, the, the trap level and the capture cross-section ratio. So here's a defect parameter solution space curve where we vary the trap level on the x-axis and see how that affects the best fit capture cross-section ratio and the fitting error. And you can see that where the elevator temperature measurements and the room temperature measurements uh, coincide happens to be the, the correct trap level. So as it happens, the trap level is, in fact, correct, uh, what was determined originally in the literature. But the capture cross-section ratio in, in this analysis is still different uh, from what's in the literature and more closer to what we get from uh, the IDLS analysis. So similarly, we can also determine what is the temperature dependence of um, the SRH lifetime. The key parameter here is the hole and electron capture cross sections. They have a temperature dependence and you can express it as a power dependence on the, the temperature. And if we make some assumptions and do a similar kind of defect parameter space, then uh, you can see that the temperature dependence of the capture cross sections uh, is roughly, has an exponent of negative 2.3. So that covers the SRH properties of the defect. Uh, so to look at the impact of firing now on, on K and on NDD, I uh, started off with nitride coated wafers uh, with an emitter and measured the NDD of these wafers um, by dark annealing and light soaking once again. Uh, so let's call this the, ND, the first NDD measurement. Um, I then either fired or didn't fire these wafers and measured the NDD again. So the difference between these two uh, NDD measurements captures the impact of firing on the SRH properties or the, the defect density. Um, in, addition, in addition to this, uh, I've also changed the, the firing recipes and I've tried to fire it multiple times, so one, two, or three times at the same, uh, with the same firing conditions. Uh, the reason for this will become clear here. So you can see that um, if you look at the fitted capture cross-section ratio for as a function of different firing temperatures, um, the black lines over there tell you what the, the fitted K value was before firing. And then after firing, you, see, you start seeing uh, a slight change, but uh, the, the colors basically represent uh, wafers fired once, twice, or thrice. So that's what the colors mean. Um, and you can see that up until about 650 degrees, the capture cross section, the fitted capture cross section ratio doesn't really change. So we can conclude that firing has no effect on the capture cross section ratio, as would be expected. Uh, however, there's this thing happening at higher temperatures, so above 650, where the fitted capture cross-section ratio changes. And what I found is that there's actually a new light-induced, uh, a new defect that's causing light-induced degradation um, when you fire the wafers above 650. And that's what's um, messing up the determination of K here. So that's the capture cross-section ratio. If we consider now the NDD, so the defect density, uh, once again, before firing, uh, the NDD is roughly the same for all wafers. And then after firing, you start seeing this interesting trend. Um, so firstly, again, for the up to about 650 degrees, you see a decrease um, in NDD uh, due to firing. Uh, and also, if you compare the different colors at a particular temperature, you'll find that there's no significant difference between the two. So firing multiple times doesn't really have an impact on the NDD. So what this is telling us is that the cooling rate um, of the firing profile and not the thermal budget is what really affects the trap density. Uh, and of course, this increase over here that you see is kind of the, the effect of this new um, non-boron oxygen CID defect that we're seeing, so kind of ignoring that data. Uh, 
So to summarize, uh, I've shown you that the capture cross-section ratio of the boron oxygen defect is higher than what was previously thought in the literature. However, the trap level is consistent with what people uh, determined previously. Uh, I also determined the temperature dependence of the capture cross-sections uh, and confirmed that firing doesn't really affect the capture cross-section ratio. Uh, however, it does have an effect on the NDD. Uh, specifically, firing reduces NDD, and increasing firing temperatures reduce NDD further. Um, but above 650, even in CZ silicon, you start getting this new CID defect. So now I move on to the second part of my talk, which is about the transition kinetics. So here's the three-state model again. Um, so each of these reactions here, you can think of it as a, a chemical reaction of sorts. So there's a, a forward reaction rate and a reverse reaction rate. So degradation, let's call it, since it's a transition between A to B, let's call it the, the rate is kappa AB. Um, and that would be the reverse reaction and so on for regeneration and destabilization. Um, so the reason why these uh, reaction rates are important and also tricky is here's the reaction rates as a function of temperature um, and this is what they look like in the dark and at higher illumination intensities the rates change um, so they're carrier dependent and so to really understand what the um, to, to sort of give a para parameterization of the the rates you'd need to know the carrier dependence and the temperature dependence. So in particular, I'll be looking at, at two reactions, uh, degradation firstly. So initially, some early studies from the 2000s showed that uh, the degradation rate is not really dependent on the illumination level uh, above about 0.1 suns. Um, however, other studies also from around the same time show that there was a strong dependence of the degradation rate on the doping density, which is related to the equilibrium hole concentration. So there's a bit of a, a mismatch over here uh, in terms of what is the carrier dependence. Um, and so I'll be testing whether the degradation rate is a function of just the equilibrium hole concentration or the total hole concentration. And likewise for annealing, um, so annealing is the reaction between state B to state A. This happens, it's typically done in the dark, uh, and you know, people have assumed that it, there is no carrier dependence because it happens in the dark. Uh, however, there was a study in compensated, uh, compensated silicon that showed um, a dependence on the, uh, of, the, of the rate of annealing. Um, to the inverse of the whole concentration. So again, uh, the question here is, does the annealing rate have a carrier dependence? Uh, but before we can really talk about uh, why there are these questions uh, in the first place and why it hasn't been resolved yet, a key issue with these reaction rate studies is that the temperature at which you do your process, let's say dark annealing, is not the temperature at which you measure your lifetime, which is usually done at room temperature. So let's say we wanted to find out what is the uh, whole concentration at a particular temperature. You'd need to know what is delta N or delta P, which is related to the generation rate and effective lifetime at that temperature. But what we're actually measuring is all of these parameters at, at room temperature. And so you need some kind of link, um, some kind of method to translate from room temperature into whatever your process temperature is. And this hasn't really been done uh, so far. So the first thing I'll try to do here is show you how I obtained a model to, to do exactly this. Um, so if we consider the, um, the generation rate uh, as a function of temperature, it looks something like this. This is relatively easy to, easy to, to determine. Um, on the Sinton machine, for example, you could just measure the optical constant as a function of temperature. Uh, and you more or less know what your generation rate dependence is. It's a bit more tricky with the effective lifetime. Um, so to do this, uh, what I did was fitted the 
dark annealed and light soaked lifetimes uh, at each temperature and determined the key parameters for these different lifetime components and plotted them versus temperature. So in this case, the surface lifetime is the key parameter is J0. And here's J0 as a function of temperature. Same thing with this uh, fixed bulk, uh, injection independent bulk. It you know, has this dependence. So then if you fit these, uh, these parameters with respect to their values at 300 deg uh, at, at room temperature, um, so uh, you can describe the temperature dependence in terms of a single value, which is the alpha param that you can see over here. So the temperature dependence of these different components uh, is determined by these particular parameters. Uh, and if you uh, write them in terms of their values at, at room temperature, um, so I've also determined it for the surface lifetime either in terms of J0 or S effective. Uh, then you end up with something like this, where the parameter value as a function of temperature is, and you can see it's, it's different for different parameters. Uh, so the lines are fits using these particular values of the exponent of temperature dependence. And one thing to note over here is that um, the values are all different for different components of lifetime. Um, and that's key because at a given temperature, um, one particular lifetime component may not necessarily dominate, uh, even though it dominates at a, at a lower or higher temperature. So, so now that we know this, uh, we can move on to actually determining the reaction kinetics. So let's start with the annealing kinetics. So if we start off with a wafer that has the boron oxygen defect completely active, so it's light soaked, and then we dark anneal the wafer um, and track the effective lifetime uh, as a function of time, we can sort of get these exponential decay rates. And if you plot them as a function of the total hole concentration, then what you find is the annealing reaction rate is inversely proportional to the whole, uh, to the total hole concentration. Um, the reason why this is important is kind of uh, shown more clearly here. So if you take the reaction rates and assume that you normalize or you don't normalize with respect to the hole concentration, um, you can describe them uh, respectively with, with different equations. But with that normalizing the, the reaction rates. Uh, they, so this is reaction rates from a few different studies and including this work. And you can see there's a, there's a big spread and the activation energy that you get from this Arrhenius plot is different depending on which data set you look at. Uh, however, if you normalize it to the whole concentration, then suddenly they all line up in a nice straight line and you get a much more accurate uh, and representative activation energy and, and prefactor. So in other words, all of this leads to a better uh, and a more accurate definition of the reaction rate for annealing. So we can do the same thing for degradation. So if we start off in the, in the dark anneal state and light soak them and track the defect density as a function of time uh, and fit the rates we get Similarly, uh, a dependence on the on on p squared. Um, so, this was the the results previously from the literature. You can see that um, the it seemed the the reaction rate for degradation seemed to flatten with illumination intensity. Um, but what could have happened here is that they didn't go to higher illumination levels, and had they had done that, then the whole concentration would have changed, and you would have kind of got this continuing curve like this. So that explains why uh, there was this difference. So once again, if you look at the non-normalized and normalized rates for degradation, um, I won't show you uh, all of the different uh, literature values, but here's one paper, and you can see that 
a small difference in the doping level um, creates a big shift in the, the rates. So imagine all of the different uh, studies with different doping levels have you know, this massive range. Um, but if you normalize them with respect to p squared, then again, they line up really well. And you can determine the activation energy uh, more accurately. So the degradation kinetics in particular have some important implications. Um, this, is the, this is what the degradation uh, actually looks like on a, on a log plot. And you can see that the degradation lifetime has this double exponential decay, um, which you see with the kink in the curve. And if we zoom into this area where you get that kink and look at the reaction rates in that period, uh, in that time period, you can see that the reaction rate itself is changing as a function of time because of its dependence on the hole concentration. Um, and so what that means is because the degradation rate is not constant with time, um, maybe some of this initial fast degradation that you see um, is actually occurring because of this uh, p squared dependence. So that's something to consider when uh, we're investigating this fast degradation stage. Uh, and likewise, the degradation kinetics has a massive influence on how you determine the reaction rates for regeneration. So here's uh, curves for how the VOC changes when you do illuminated annealing. So if you start off uh, in the dark anneal state, um, you can see that it transitions through state B and then goes to state C. So what this means is the reaction rate for regeneration, um, so sorry, a regeneration only happens after you've got enough defects in state, uh, in state B. Um, so in this case, because the regeneration is only happening um, after you have enough in state B, your recovery might be slower. Whereas let's say instead of starting out in state A, we started out everything in state B, so you light soak the wafers first, and then you try to eliminate it, uh, eliminate it anneal it, then you might get a very different uh, rate of lifetime recovery. Uh, so in other words, the reaction rate for regeneration can be limited by the degradation reaction rate. Um, and there's been some other studies that have kind of confirmed this. Um, so if you start off in state A versus state B, you get uh, different recovery rates. Um, so what that means is to accurately characterize the regeneration rate, you need to consider the starting state of the, of the defect. So to sum up, uh, the, we've developed a method to, to obtain effective lifetime at any given process temperature from uh, measurements done at room temperature. And we've used that to determine the carrier dependence for degradation and annealing associated with the boron oxygen defect. And what we find is that this carrier dependence is actually quite critical and can explain some of the uh, known phenomena that we see in the literature. Um, I'll now move on to the mechanisms for permanent deactivation of the BO defect. Uh, so what we, so once again, this is the three-state model. Uh, if you think about mitigation of boron oxygen, what we're really talking about when you consider the three-state model is this regeneration reaction. So if you can maximize this reaction, you can get everything into state C, and then your lifetime doesn't uh, degrade anymore. So that's, that's where you want to be. Um, but the question is, why does regeneration happen? What's the fundamental mechanism? In addition to this, there's, you can also think of the boron oxygen defect as being formed from precursors. And so some of this thermal deactivation you're seeing due to firing or oxidation or phosphorus diffusion, this could be the defect dissociating into its precursors. Uh, and likewise, there can be a, a forward reaction as well. So. Um, so recently, there was a proposal that 
the boron oxygen defect is actually either interstitial or substitutional boron uh, combining with a oxygen dimer and the oxygen dimer is in some kind of equilibrium with the oxygen monomer concentration. So within this model, uh, those would be the precursors and that's your defect. So there was only a description of this model given but wasn't tested. So that's what I'll attempt to do over here. And if that's true, then we might understand a little bit more about what um, this thermal deactivation really is. So let's start off with regeneration and why it happens. Um, so in this case, I did a very similar experiment to, the, to what I showed you before. But in this case, uh, I had um, wafers, wafers with an emitter, p-type wafers with an emitter, but with nitride um, or oxide dielectrics, and then finally uh, bare wafers without any dielectric at all. Um, so I then tried to measure the NDD fired or didn't fire them and so on, and then measured them again. And then finally did a regeneration after firing. And you can see that this, so between the second and the third NDD measurement, you get information about what, uh, about how much regeneration affects uh, the NDD. So what we see over here is uh, for the three different types of wafers, um, the only wafer that saw any significant change in the NDD, any significant reduction in NDD due to regeneration, was the wafer that had a nitride and was fired. Uh, and as we know, nitride, uh, silicon nitride dielectrics have a, um, a high concentration of hydrogen and therefore this seems to suggest that it's uh, that regeneration is related to to hydrogenation. However, we do see some improvements even in the hydrogen lean wafers, so the oxide passivated or the bare wafers. Uh, and there's been some other evidence of this in the literature. This is a study uh, that was done recently uh, where they had aluminum oxide passivation and p dot pss passivation. And these are all meant to be low temperature dielectrics and relatively hydrogen lean. Uh, and what they saw is that over a very long period of time, uh, they've found regeneration to occur. And so this kind of, uh, this, there's some doubt about whether hydrogen is directly responsible or whether there's uh, multiple mechanisms. Uh, but what we can say is that regeneration in a reasonable time frame requires, seems to require hydrogen. And there might, in fact, be multiple pathways uh, within regeneration. One of them could be hydrogen-based. Another one, we don't know yet. Um, now let's look at thermal deactivation. Uh, we'll go back to this experiment again. And in this case, we're looking at the relative change in NDD due to firing. Um, same thing as before, fired at, at different temperatures, once, twice, or thrice. Um, so this is the same data you've seen before, the change in NDD with firing. Um, the NDD goes down with increasing firing temperature. Um, and then after a certain point, you get this other defect. So just if we ignore um, these higher firing temperatures, if you consider what's happening here, you could think of it as the boron oxygen defect going into um, you know, becoming something else. Uh, and that's why the density reduces. So if you consider just this reaction where BO goes to X um, and you um, determine the, the kind of equilibrium concentration as a function of temperature, you get start getting some information about the, the activation energy, the potential activation energy of this, of this BO to X reaction. Um, However, if you take that a step further and you consider what should a reaction like this uh, cause to, uh, when you fire the wafers multiple times, you see that it doesn't quite match up with the experimental data. So the experimental data shows that when you fire once, twice, or thrice, the NDD doesn't really change. Um, but a reaction of this um, 
of with in this model you should see a decrease in NDD each time you fire it again. So clearly this model is, is too simplistic to describe this thermal deactivation process. So now let's consider the, the model proposed by Voronkov recently. And if we do that, then we can model the, uh, the changes in NDD again. Uh, however, the original model, the way it's described in, in the original paper, uh, doesn't really seem to give a good fit. Um, but if we tweak the model a little bit by changing some of the assumed um, rates within, within that model, then you can get a much better fit to the, uh, to the data. And importantly, um, in this model, firing multiple times does not change the NDD. So it's quite consistent with, uh, with what we see. So in other words, that model fits OK, needs a little bit of adjustment. Uh, but if we assume that the model is more or less correct, then thermal deactivation fundamentally is due to the dissociation of the boron oxygen defect into its, into its precursors. So we've seen two different ways to reduce the NDD. And the question here is, are these two uh, mechanisms related. Now let's review uh, what happens with um, what happens with thermal deactivation. So when you fire the wafers, the NDD reduces, and depending on whether you have silicon oxide or silicon nitride samples, what you see is that you get a similar amount of reduction in NDD regardless of the wafer type, um, and that's important because the silicon oxide wafers shouldn't have a lot of hydrogen. Silicon nitride should have more hydrogen. Um, and if you see the trend as a function of uh, firing temperature, you can see uh, the green curves sort of show you how the NDD comes down in the nitride sample. Uh, and even though the trends don't quite match in the lower temperatures, the blue and the green curves more or less match up in the, in the higher temperatures. So the trend in NDD reduction due to firing is the same regardless of how much hydrogen you have in the wafer. So we can conclude at the very least that thermal deactivation is not hydrogen related. Um, however, as we've seen with regeneration, hydrogen seems to play a big role in how much regeneration you can achieve. Um, and from that we can say at least that regeneration is influenced by is uh, by hydrogen. Uh, but you can see that the, the, the dependence on hydrogen gives you some clue as to whether they are the same or different. Um, and clearly, because hydrogen only affects one of these uh, deactivation mechanisms, they are probably not related. Um, and if we accept that the boron oxygen defect is, in fact, going back into its precursor state. Um, you have that piece of the reaction. And then you have your three-state model. And they should all be, they should all sort of be related to each other. Uh, it's, yeah, so it's, it's clear that both, both these models are valid. Um, but can they be combined? So perhaps uh, what's really happening is that when you start off in state A, that's the formed defect. Um, and if you push it back thermally, uh, you can deactivate them and go back to the defect precursors. Um, so in other words, if you were starting in state B and you wanted to mitigate, uh, remove the boron oxygen defect essentially, you could either uh, do these high temperature processes, and then it would um, push the system in this direction. And then, uh, or you can hydrogenate the wafers and push it in the other direction. So in summary, um, I've shown you that regeneration requires sufficient quantities of hydrogen, uh, but it could involve other mechanisms. Um, however, thermal deactivation is not related to hydrogen and is kind of independent of the, the type of sample. Uh, and it's likely that thermal deactivation is, is actually defect dissociation.
And I've also combined these two mechanisms and proposed a, a sort of four state model for the boron oxygen defect. So before I end, I just want to talk about the implications of this work. It's all pretty technical, and uh, maybe this will sort of hammer home the, the message more. Um, so the first implication of this work is we have, a, we have a better understanding of the boron oxygen defect as a result of this work. Um, I've just shown you how we know more about the recombination properties. We know more about the mechanisms. And there's now a better model to describe how the defect behaves. And what this, what this means is that it's easier, firstly, to identify the boron oxygen defect um, if we know the recombination properties more accurately. And finally, the, uh, knowing what is the mechanism of permanent deactivation means you can now tailor um, methods to mitigate the defect depending on where in the cell processing or module processing you are. So, that's why all of this is important. Um, the second implication uh, of this work is we can model the reaction rates more accurately. And again, the, we have a better model for the boron oxygen defect. Um, we have this method to convert lifetime from room temperature to high temperatures. And we know the carrier dependence of some of these reactions. And at the end of the day, what that, what that does is we are better able to estimate how long, for example, um, you need to regenerate or under what conditions you need to regenerate your wafers to get um, to, to cause regeneration quickly. Um, and so if you're able to do regeneration in, say, one or two seconds as opposed to a few hours, then suddenly that's a lot more commercially relevant. Uh, so all of this kinetics modeling makes those uh, time estimations more accurate. So with that, I just want to thank uh, my funding sources, the uh, Australian Renewable Energy Agency, ACAP, uh, the commercial partners in the ARENA grant, um, and others. And I also want to thank uh, the people who are involved in this, uh, my supervisors, Malcolm Abbott, Stuart Wenham, and Matt Edwards. Um, thank you for seeing me through my PhD. Um, and I also want to thank the Hydrogenation Group, who've been uh, an amazing bunch of people to work with and uh, to bounce ideas off. So thank you. Uh, I also want to thank everybody who's helped me in the lab, uh, uh, especially the Maya processing team. I wouldn't have samples to do my research if it wasn't for them. Uh, also, the LDOT team and anybody else who's ever come into the lab and given me a hand, uh, thank you. And finally, uh, the admin staff at, at SPRI and at TETB, um, thank you for keeping the paperwork in order. And lastly, uh, but most importantly, I want to thank my friends and family. Uh, I've got my family here, my friends, uh, most of you are here. Thank you for being there. And thank you for your attention. Um, great talk, Nathan. Thank you. Um, have you had any feedback on your uh, revised model for the four state model? Um, so I haven't actually started modeling the, um, well, I haven't started using the four state model in the combined form just yet. Um, but there's been some new results from other, from other groups kind of that are like adding more information to make this model more accurate. Um, so no, not, not direct feedback, but I think it's, it's creeping along slowly. Alison. Um, it was a really nice talk there, Keenan. Um, with the, the firing exper experiments and the uh, high temperature, you said that this is another new, I thought you said it was not boron oxygen. Um, is there a reason why you thought it was not boron oxygen, the defect that's activated in the high temperatures? So, uh, I mean, if you look at the capture cross-section ratio that was fitted, um, 
yeah, at lower temperatures, it's, you know, it's pretty clear that it is boron oxygen because the capture cross-section doesn't change. And then suddenly at this high, high temperature, about 650, the fitted capture cross-section ratio started changing quite a bit. Uh, also, the, the absolute lifetimes didn't, weren't making a lot of sense. Um, so in spite of dark annealing the wafers, they didn't completely go back. Um, they weren't quite flat. So there was some other SRH defect in there. Um, and also there's, uh, I mean, now they've, you know, there's been other evidence of this uh, firing activated defect in, in CZ. And there's talk about how it's actually similar to the, the multi defect, the multi CID defect, or it could even be the same thing. So you mean um, metal related? I, yeah, so a couple of the guys here have done some work and they've kind of shown that they're, they could be practically the same. So in my thesis, I have an estimate of the capture cross section ratio of the other defect. Um, the error bars are quite big on that one, but it's, it matches pretty well with the, the multi-capture cross-section ratio. So I personally think it's, it's the same defect. Other questions? Yeah, so you have any comments from mom? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank Nathan again, and you will be here tomorrow as well. So if yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you, Nathan. Thank you.